Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. By now, you've heard me say it time and time again, growing old does not have to mean your best days are behind you. And it doesn't mean you're destined to experience nagging health issues. Well, in my opinion, age really is just a number. It's the choices we make and the way we live our lives that really impacts our health and longevity. Now, in a moment, I'll talk well, I'll talk with Marta Zaraska, a science journalist and author of the new book, Growing Young, wow, right up my alley, who says the power of community and connection are some of the best tools we have for living long, happy, and healthy lives. We'll talk about why loneliness may be even worse for your health than cigarettes, and share ways you can maximize your lifespan in easy, practical, and unexpected ways. Marta, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for inviting me, Stephen. So before we dive into your research, I'd love to hear about what started you on this path. How did you go from writing novels to traveling the world to study the link between mind-body connections and longevity? I mean, novels were in my very, very early years, let's say, but uh, but I've been traveling the world for quite a while now, first as a foreign affairs journalist, and uh, now also as a science journalist, I often travel uh, to meet researchers and to try things on myself sometimes. Uh, also for writing Growing Young, I've done quite a lot of traveling. I went to Japan to talk to centenarians there. Uh, I participated in some research in Oxford that involved catching one wild mice in the forest. Uh, I went to a longevity camp in Portugal. So there were there was quite a lot of traveling involved and uh, quite, quite a lot of fun, I have to admit. So what were some of the most fascinating cultures you studied while researching this topic? I mean, so definitely the Japanese culture is very, very interesting in regards of longevity. And when uh, people think about Japan and longevity, you know, it's the longest living nation on the planet. So obviously we want to learn from them. And uh, usually we talk about the diet, right? The Okinawa diet, especially, uh, even though Okinawa is no longer the longest lived uh, <laughs> prefecture in Japan, it's Nagano these days. Uh, but we really like to look what they are eating, right? So uh, how much fish they are eating, how much sushi, how much uh, soy and vegetables and so on. Uh, and yet when I was talking to researchers in Japan, one of the things that usually comes up very fast in any conversation is actually purpose in life. This is something they recognize as a very important part of how long and how healthy we live. You know, when they talk to researchers in the West, they talk about the diet, about exercise, um, sleep perhaps. And in Japan, really purpose in life it comes out at least you know, maybe second or third sentence that we are talking about purpose in life. So this is really something that's uh, seen as a health uh, health behavior in Japan or health measure. Well, let's let's go there. Um, what the heck is purpose in life? I mean, is that my purpose in life is getting up and having a cup of coffee and a donut? Or I mean, what does that mean in Japan? <laughs> I mean, so they call it ikigai. I'm probably pronouncing it all no, wrong. I think that's but... correct. I think that's correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so they, they call it ikigai. And um, usually when the Japanese people talk about their ikigai or this purpose in life or reason for living, they ta don't talk about donuts or they don't talk about golfing. They talk about the ways in which they can help others or contribute to the community, for example. So one thing that really uh, I found fascinating when I was traveling in Japan, I visited something called the Gray Hair Retirement Agency. And um, sorry, actually employment agency. And uh, what they mean by that is these are employment agencies for people who have retired. And uh, yes, you heard me right. Uh, this is uh, the idea is that you retire from your regular job, and then you go to the special retirement employment agency, and you find yourself an easier, perhaps part-time job that will still make you involved in the society and make you useful, basically. So people go from being bankers to being 
public space gardeners or from working in marketing to helping kids cross the street on the way to school. And uh, it's actually very, very popular in Japan. You see these elderly people everywhere uh, doing their retirement silver hair jobs. And this is also very often their ikigai, this purpose in life. So being useful, helping others, doing something. It can be something very small, you know. It can be uh, helping your neighbors keep your street clean, for example, or taking care of your grandchildren. But there is usually some helping involved. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in my book, The Longevity Paradox, one of the things I, I stress is that when you look at many of the long-lived societies, their, their super uh, elders really never retire from what they do. Uh, they're still herding sheep, they're still <laughs> making cheese, or they're still, they're, they're really an important you know, resource for the community, if nothing else. Uh, certainly in the West, uh, uh, sadly, we now, we try to retire early, and I know in France, you know, they push to retire early. And I tell my patients, uh, don't you ever retire. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really one of the stupidest things you can do, because I, I literally see people's health begin, you know, this downward spiral after they retire. Um, and, and so you found that not only in Japan, but did you find other communities where that's true? I mean, there is plenty of Western research on that as well, exactly what you were saying, that when people retire, very often their health actually does go downhill. They People who retire early tend to live shorter than people who don't retire. And um, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to copy exactly what the Japanese are doing. You know, their cultures are different and we don't have to all become public space gardeners, let's say, but it's important to find something. You don't have to employ it, you know, have an actual employment contract until you're 110, uh, but you have to have this purpose in life. And there is so much research on that, uh, on very various societies, American, British, other European ones as well, that you have to have something to live for. It can be, as I said before, it can be really something small, just the re reason to get up in the morning that also makes you contribute to the society, not, not just coffee and donuts. Yeah, and I actually, uh, I give uh, some of my elderly patients prescriptions to get a dog. And uh, because that, you know, purpose of taking care of the dog, it turns out the dog obviously gives them a wonderful purpose. And they, uh, they frame their little prescription for a dog uh, <laughs> after they get the dog. They, oh no, I'm too old for a, you know, a dog. Well, you know, what if I die? I said, don't worry, somebody's gonna take your dog. And so, yeah, that, and you're right, people have to have a purpose. And another thing about a dog, actually, there is a, some fascinating research showing that if you look deeply into your dog's eyes, you get, you get a boost of oxytocin, so the social hormone, that has lots of downhill also positive effects on your body. For example, it's the natural painkiller and ha helps inflammation at bay. So looking into your dog's eyes can have direct physical effects, positive effects on your body. My, my wife looks into one of our dog's eyes in particular uh, all the time. It's a very soulful <laughs> look. Uh, we, have, we have three dogs now. One of, one of them we would not look in her eyes because we call her the devil dog for obvious <laughs> reasons. And I'm not sure that would have the same effect. So speaking of social and social behavior, you, in your book, you mentioned that we are a social species that has actually self-domesticated over time. Uh, and I want to hear your take on this because actually my, uh, my research as an undergraduate at Yale was in human evolution, biologic and social evolution. So this has been one of my fascinations for a very long time. So go for it. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so self-domestication is obviously not my discovery. It's something I've uh, talked over a lot with uh, Professor Richard Rangam uh, at Harvard. He wrote a very delightful book on this topic, exactly how humans self-domesticated. Uh, and basically he argues that um, just like other species, for example, dogs, as we mentioned before, are domesticated. Humans also are a domesticated species because our temperaments have changed and also our body has changed in line with what happens to 
to other species when they are domesticated. So, for example, we are much milder you know, in our temperaments than uh, our cousin chimpanzees. Uh, and um, we also look slightly different. We, for example, have white eyes, Clara, we have pink lips. Uh, and these are things that happen. There are some very complicated biological uh, processes uh, involving something called neural crest. I won't go deep into it. It's, uh, it's fairly complicated. But basically, that co cause discoloration that's connected to the way, way your hormones work in your body. These are the same hormones that make us milder, calmer. And uh, basically, humans, what Rangam argues, self-selected for milder temperaments, uh, for not being so hot-tempered. You know, the chimpanzees, when they start fighting, they will basically bite each other's heads off, sometimes literally. Uh, we tend not to do it. Yes, sometimes we fight in bars and so on and so on, but this is really nothing compared to how we would have been if we haven't self-domesticated. And uh, before you say that we are still pretty mean species because we go to war, uh, Rangam argues that it's a very different type of aggression. There is something, there is difference between pre-planned, cold-blooded aggression that is hot-tempered chimpanzee style aggression, which we don't really have much of. So we are very likely domesticated species. And uh, why is it important? It's important because we have all these social hormones. So uh, oxytocin, serotonin, vasopressin, endorphins. And these are hormones that are very important for our social lives, for being the social ape, uh, and also directly physically for the functioning of our body, because they are both having this emotional effects and very purely physiological effects on us. So uh, that, let's go down that road for a little bit because you and I off camera were talking about COVID-19. And I agree with you and I think all of us agree that we are a very social creature and we clearly um, are social animals and we need social interaction. Uh, what do you think about COVID-19? Can we, can we handle this social isolation much longer? <laughs> Very difficult question. And unfortunately, the truth is that social isolation is not good for humans. Humans, it's just not. We evolved to be among others with our tribes, and this is where we function the best. For example, when we are socially isolated, uh, our antiviral response doesn't function the same way. It actually functions worse, which is very worrying when you are thinking about what we are trying to avoid here, right? We are trying to avoid the virus, and by being lonely or isolated, our antiviral response functions worse. Uh, if we are not getting hugs, for example, studies show that when people are not hugged often, uh, their antiviral response also is worse. They are much more prone for to get a cold, for example. Uh, people who are lonely, you know, there, are, there were some fascinating experiments where scientists actually put the cold viruses into volunteers' noses, uh, at the same time measuring who was lonely and how lonely they were. And those who were the most lonely only, we're also the most likely to actually develop the symptoms of the cold after having the virus put into their noses. Uh, so, you know, things are not good when you're socially isolated. Of course, I'm absolutely not saying that we should stop socially distancing. I live in France. We've been really, really touched badly here with the virus. And we've been in a, on a complete lockdown for 56 days when we couldn't leave our house without a special permission. Uh, so, yes, we need to isolate. But uh, also, yes, it has negative effects on us. So we have to do things to counteract it. You know, you said even looking in your dog's eyes can help. And if you have other people in your household that you can safely hug, then please do so and do so often because it's really important for proper functioning of all the social systems in our body. Uh, so I'm going to go home and hug my dog and look and look the, in the eyes as well, as well as my wife. I'll hug her and look her in the eyes too. <laughs> So what, what is it about you know, loneliness and the social distancing that, that's so damaging to our health? I mean, you, you, in the book, compare it to the health dangers like cigarette smoking or bad nutrition. I mean, is it that bad? It's that bad. I mean, we evolved as social apes. Think about exactly our closest cousin chimpanzees, even though they are not so domesticated, they are still the closest we have. And as just like they are, we, they are, we are very social, right? We evolved to live in a tribe. And when we are outside of the tribe, all these negative processes start uh, cascading down in our bodies, starting with the uh, fight or flight response, right? So this kind of stress response. When you're alone on the savanna, obviously alone 
lot of bad things can happen to you when you are outside alone without the help of the others. And all the stress systems start working, cascading, lots of hormones get released, including cortisol, adrenaline, all this stuff that generally has bad effects on your health, just to simplify it very much here. Uh, and um, and as you said, you know, loneliness uh, is so bad for us that when, for example, scientists put all these numbers together, they show that a complex measure of social integration. So, for example, how many friends you all have, whether you know your neighbors, whether you're involved in your community, whether you have a romantic partner, all this taken together can lower your mortality risk by about 65%. Whereas cigarettes, it's only about... I mean, by cigarettes, I mean stopping smoking if you're a very heavy smoker. This can lower your mortality risk by about 50%. Whereas diet and exercise, it usually hovers between 20 and 30%. So you have 65% versus 20 to 30%. So this is really, really huge impact on our life if, you're, if we have this kind of really well-built social network. So are you saying that if I want to live a long time, I better go get a romantic relationship if I don't have one? <laughs> I mean, it's it's it'll be very good for you, yes, especially for men. Actually, so we, bizarrely, studies tend to show that men profit much more from a romantic relationship, committed romantic relationship, than the women. And uh, even more bizarrely, whereas for women the romantic relationship does have to be definitely happy, for men even a so-so romantic relationship actually helps too. So uh, scientists are still quite uh, surprised by this. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that women tend to organize the social life of the family, but uh, definitely there is some kind of effect like this in research. It's been you know, replicated over and over and over again that men can profit even from a mediocre uh, romantic relationship. And what and is there evidence that when a divorce happens or a loss of a spouse for other reasons, um, that men will do worse from all that? Yes, unfortunately, there is something called the widower effect. And uh, there is also, again, plenty of research showing that we, especially within the first week after a spouse dies, the second spouse can pass, is much more likely to pass away as well. This effect has been known for centuries. Uh, recently, it has been really thoroughly co confirmed by you know proper modern studies, but it does exist. Uh, so it's, it's really risky, especially the first seven days after the spouse passes. Yeah, no, I've definitely uh, seen that in my own practice uh, where, you know, one, you know, one of the spouses may actually be exceptionally healthy and the, and the unhealthy one passes away. And you're right, within a very short time period, all of a sudden that, uh, that spouse, I've even seen uh, spouses admitted to the hospital within a couple days of each other uh, when one gets severely ill, the next one ends up in the bed next door. So... Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. So, um, what about synchrony with others? Uh, the power of synchrony. What is, do, do I have to be synchronized with my, my tribe, or what does that mean? You don't have to be synchronized, but as I write in Growing Young, synchrony has a very powerful effect on us that tends to double the beneficial effects of some things that we do with others. For example, things like dancing or singing or sports. Uh, so what happens when you do things in synchrony? And by synchrony, I mean, for example, when we line dance or when we sing in a choir or we do this kind of Macarena style, style of dancing. Uh, so what happens is that uh, you get about a double boost of endorphins, so those social hormones that are also natural painkillers. Uh, scientists don't completely understand why this can be happening. Some say mirror neurons. That's very often what scientists say when they don't know what's happening. Uh, other <laughs> look at some different parts of the brain, um, like insula, for example. Um, but we still don't completely understand what's happening. There is possibly there is some electrical synchronization between our brains as well. Uh, De definitely humans love synchrony. You know, you can see it that, for example, when you're sitting uh, in a rocking chair and there is a second person in a second rocking chair uh, beside you, at, after a very short while, you'll synchronize and start rocking in the same 
speed. Uh, even small babies love synchrony to the point that they prefer a person uh, who, with whom they are engaged in doing something in synchrony. They will be much more willing to help somebody with whom they have been in synchrony. And the same happens to adults as well. You are much more likely to like people with whom you've done synchrony. So for example, if you sing in a choir, you are going to be very much more connected and trusting the people with whom uh, you sing than if you engage in some other activity. So synchrony is very, very beneficial to us. Can you also be in synchrony if you're a, a fan of a sports team and you go to watch them? Is that okay? Or do you actually have to be active? I mean, it depends what you do as a fan. You know, if you do this kind of wave or kind of the shouting at the same time with others, yes, it works perfectly well. It doesn't matter what kind of synchrony. You know, you can. There are even studies showing that you can be drumming fingers on a on a table together in synchrony with others, and it already works as long as you do something synchronously. We just love. You know, our bodies love this kind of togetherness that is created this way. So uh, in the United States, uh, kids play a game, patty cake, patty cake, baker's man. Uh, <laughs> sure. And so that's synchrony. I mean, is that why we it's do that? It's synchrony, yes. Yes, we just, uh, as I said, even babies love synchrony. We, we evolved to love synchrony. You can see synchrony everywhere, you know, in all the, on all the continents for our history. Humans were doing synchronous dancing and synchronous right. singing. The prayer is synchrony, right? So it really does give us something. And scientists now see that the endorphins seem to be key here. So this happy hormones that also this is the same thing that you get when you have the so-called runner's high. You also get endorphins. And here you get double the runner's high from doing things in synchrony. So if you jog, for example, it's better to do it with another person because you'll have double the benefits. Huh. All right. Very good. That means I got to I got to get faster because my wife's a better runner than me. But OK. <laughs> OK, I want to change directions for a minute. So. Uh, if there's one key to longevity my listeners hear me talk about all the time, it's the importance of gut health. And as I explain in my book, Longevity Paradox, we actually share very similar gut microbiomes to those that we hang around with most often. Uh, can you explain the relationships between relationships and gut health? Yes, totally. As I said before, when I was researching growing young, I traveled to Oxford where I, um, where I observed some researchers studying mice in the forest. And what they were doing is exactly to study how relationships and gut health are connected. Uh, so what they were doing, they were observing uh, using infrared cameras, mice in their burrows to see whom, who was meeting whom and who was friends with whom and so on and so on. To, to check on their social lives. And at the same time, from time to time, they would very humanely uh, catch them and basically check their poop to see what kind of microbes they had and uh, also check on their temperament, whether they were anxious or happy and so on and so on. And they could really see that uh, the mice were the, the mice that were the most social and that had the most diverse networks of friends, you could say, had also the more the most diverse microbiomes in their guts. And as we know, in general, having the diverse microbiome in your gut is a good thing for your health. And the same thing happens with us humans. We actually tend to exchange our gut microbes with other people, also with family pets. So you're also exchanging your mi gut microbes with your dogs. And, um, and for example, when uh, scientists study uh, team sports, they can see that where two teams are meeting and playing some kind of contact sports, they also exchange microbes between each other. And these are generally good things for us and uh, also affecting our emotions and our temperaments, because we know from research on rodents that if you transfer, for example, microbiomes from what for a, from a gloomy mice mouse to a to another mouse, the second mouse will become gloomy as well, and so 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 it really impacts. It's all very much connected. No, that's ab absolutely true. Um, we're beginning to realize how you know important the gut microbiome, um, the diversity, uh, and you're right. Uh, there are, you can have a happy microbiome and you can have a, an aggressive microbiome and you can have a depressed microbiome. And you're right, this can be transferred. Um, and 
long ago I wrote, uh, back in the 1930s, they actually did an experiment, which you'd never be able to do now, is they, they gave people who were depressed, who were admitted to hospitals, enemas, cleaned them out, and then gave them fecal uh, enemas from happy people. And <laughs> most of the depressed people, you know, got happy. Uh, and it's like, what a good treatment, really. And, yeah, so at least now, these days, you can try to hug more happy people, I guess, you know, that's the more 21st century approved uh, way of doing right. things. Well, and it's true that, you know, if, you're, if your friends are obese, uh, you have a very high likelihood of becoming obese yourself, even if you, you know, were skinny when you joined that group of people. They, they transfer this obesogenic microbiome to you, just hanging out with people. Do, so does that mean that we shouldn't hang out with obese people or? <laughs> that sounds horrible. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I don't want to hang out with you. No, I, I don't think we mean to imply no, that. I, no, nah, definitely not. It's definitely better to have more friends than, you know, to be. And I think that if you went into this kind of mindset, it has to have some negative consequences. I cannot imagine that it, this can be good. No, I, yeah, I, I, we're not implying that, those of you who are listening. <laughs> so what about, what about probiotics, friendly bacteria? Is there any connection to brain activity and emotions with probiotics? Oh, yeah. Yes, plenty. And uh, as you probably know, there, are, there is also quite fascinating research showing that when people drink uh, probiotics, for example, uh, such as, uh, you know, fermented milk products, and they, it can affect the, their emotions and their moods, for ex generally for the better, right? So then they can become less anxious, for example, if they, if they drink this kind of products. Now, so many people, um, you know, were the the highest evolved species, ha, ha, ha. Uh, but so many people, you know, just don't like the idea that single cell organisms like bacteria uh, could actually have some effect on our mood and happiness. Uh, what say you? I mean, we are, you know, biological creatures. It's all so fascinatingly connected. You know, when I when I talk, for example, about those social hormones I mentioned before, they also play a role when we're talking about gut microbiome, because actually when the microbes in your gut are talking with your brain, one of the pathways they're using are, again, those neurotransmitters. So, for example, serotonin. So it all kind of, it's all connected, you know, your, your stress or your stress access, your social actions, your emotions, your gut, it's, it's just all so connected. And your, uh, has, have there been any research of social isolation changing the gut micro microbiome for the worse? I mean, there is some research like that. Unfortunately, it's, it's been done on mice. As you said, these days we don't tend to do such uh, fascinating but very ethically inappropriate research as they did in early 19th, the early 20th century. Yeah. Uh, so the, these days it's done on mice. And yes, there is research showing that when mice are socially isolated, the gut microbiome is much poorer with obviously uh, health effects, negative health effects. So, you know, I want to get back to uh, volunteering for a minute. Um, my, my father took early retirement at age 62 because uh, his, his father had died at age 54 and my father was just absolutely convinced that, you know, he was going to die, you know, in, in that age and he was shocked that he was still alive at 62. But it, it's fascinating. He initially, it, 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 retirement was not for him, so he became a a greeter at Walmart. I don't know if you know Walmart, it's yeah. one of our giant That's stores. And he, he really loved it. But then he became, he started volunteering at his local hospital and became kind of head of the volunteers at the hospital. Uh, his only problem was he, he lived until he was 91. And uh, you know, he said, you know, if I had realized I was gonna live when I was 90th birthday, he says, you know, if I lived, knew I was gonna live to 90, I wouldn't have retired at 62. <laughs> but, you know, I think that volunteering uh, was, you know, what had him make it to 91. Um, so is, is volunteering that important after, after you retire or can you volunteer even while you're doing other jobs? 
I mean, definitely volunteering or generally caring for other people, being kind is extremely important. And there is lots of research on volunteering showing that anywhere it can lower your mortality risk anywhere between 22 and 44 percent. So at least as much as healthy diets. So eating, let's say, six portions of fruits and vegetables a day. So this is a very, very powerful effect. Once again, Uh, there are studies showing that volunteers, for example, spend about 37% less time in hospitals than people who don't volunteer. So there is really a lot of things going on here. Uh, So, but also kindness, just simple everyday kindness can work. You don't have to formally volunteer, even though definitely it has very strong benefits, but generally caring for other people, just being helpful, even in formal settings, uh, it activates this, uh, what scientists call caregiving systems in our body that basically calm down our stress response because you cannot care for other people if you are extremely anxious so the body systems that are responsible for stress have to uh, kind of calm down if you're when you're caring for others so it has very beneficial effects on our bodies you know uh, oftentimes when i bring this up with my patients they say well i have i don't have a clue in how i go about volunteering for something Uh, did you ever run into that in your research it's like, I mean, how do you volunteer? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. But I said, again, you know, it can be formal volunteering, but it can also be just being kind in everyday life. There, are, there is also research showing that just so-called random acts of kindness, right? So opening doors for other people, letting others ahead of in traffic, making coffee for your spouse or buying cookies for uh, other people at work. Uh, Such things also activate this caregiving system, just basically thinking about others and can really lower uh, your levels of stress hormones in your body. I actually, when I was writing uh, Growing Young, I did some fascinating experiments. I I mean, experiments because it was just sample of one, so not that scientific, but uh, I did it in collaboration with scientists from King's College London uh, who actually um, checked my cortisol levels uh, three times a day uh, when I was was engaging in acts of kindness on Sundays and on other days I was just living my life as usual and uh, what they discovered is that on the days when I was doing plenty plentiful kindness so I would basically wake up in the morning and think okay how can I be nice today and I would it was actually lots of fun actually doing that so I would do this very small things but just you know maybe buy a sandwich for a homeless person or just uh, uh, pick up some trash on a, on a, on a street uh, where I live just very small things but on those days uh, my cortisol levels were much healthier than on all the other days even though completely independent on how actually stressful these days were for me. So it was very fascinating for me to see it on myself, uh, even though there is lots of proper research on big samples showing exactly the same thing, that when you do kind things, when you help others, it calms down your stress response, you get better cortisol, uh, healthier cortisol response uh, as an effect. So now wait a minute, suppose you wake up tomorrow and it's the day you're supposed to be kind and you go, I don't want to be kind today. This is not a good day to be kind. And then you had to be kind. So would it drop your stress levels or did it make you stress that you had to be kind? I mean, maybe for some people, I actually experienced it as a lot of, it's very, it was very pleasurable, you know, just even planning the kindness. Uh, I thoroughly I enjoyed it. All right. So what... Um, you, we mentioned something about um, women, and women in general uh, are far better at socialization than men. Uh, one of, for instance, the reasons that Weight Watchers uh, does very, very, very well with women is that women really want to get in a group and talk. And it does really horrible with men. It's never worked for men because men, the only reason men want to get in a group is, you know, talk about football or, or drink. Uh, so what is it about women? How, how, how come you guys are so good at emphasizing with, with others? 
I mean, it's true that research does show that women volunteer more. They have they are better at friendships. Uh, you know, probably a lot of it's cultural. Uh, there maybe it's a little bit based on empathy. There there are studies showing that testosterone uh, has negative effects on empathy levels. Although also uh, it's not like that if you're bo- born with little empathy, you cannot do anything about it because you can practice empathy as well. But it is true that testosterone is has negative effects. Effects on, on empathy, so there is something biological probably going on as well. Uh, so, which also explains, for example, what we've talked before, right? This marriage effect that for men even a so-so marriage can be good, whereas for women it has to be a happy marriage. So, so definitely some of the difference why women tend to live longer than men may be due to their uh, social skills and um, engaging in volunteering or donation, donating money and things like that. Okay, now another thing you bring up in the book is optimism, and I, uh, I write about that as well. So what, what does the effect of being optimistic have on longevity? I mean, optimism is amazing when you think about it. It can add anywhere from four to ten years to your life. So it's it's really a lot. And uh, there were so many different studies done on very different populations showing the same effect. And very often this number ten years uh, tends to appear. For example, the very famous study on Catholic nuns where scientists uh, studied diaries written by nuns, which you know are great for studying things like that because they tend to wake up at the same hour, they eat the same thing. They uh, spend their days in very similar ways. So it's a very controlled population. And yet those nuns who in their diaries were using the most upbeat language, the most cheerful words to describe their lives, uh, outlived uh, by about exactly 10 years uh, the other nuns who were much more gloomy in the way they saw their life. They were using much more kind of pessimistic and downbeat words. Uh, and the same very similar study was done also on Facebook famous psychologist as well. Uh, who, uh, scientists analyzed their autobiographies and ch- found that those who were the most upbeat also lived 10 years longer. Uh, so there is something definitely going on, especially this 10 years, that, uh, that people who are more optimistic, more cheerful, uh, simply live longer. Is there a way to make yourself more optimistic or more cheerful, or is that some innate quality? I mean, very small part of it is innate, but is a very small part. Uh, There's plenty of books out there that tell you that you can learn optimism and uh, there is plenty of research confirming that, yes, indeed, you can practice it. Uh, I give some tips in Growing Young, but uh, again, there are lots of books that are have been written only about how to become more optimistic. So it's definitely something that can be worked on. Well, I always ask for at least one tip. So give me one tip on how to practice optimism. Uh, I think it's just uh, changing, the, I mean, the most typical is the cognitive behavior therapy, right? So just changing your thought patterns. And uh, whenever something you are having a negative thought, try to change it. Try to first think where it came from and whether, for example, how likely does this thing is to happen when you are saying, I don't know, um, I'm going to definitely lose my job, right? And is it likely to happen? How, you know, uh, are you just uh, maybe dramatizing things that are not really, really going to happen? So, but as I said, there are lots and lots of books that uh, have been written exactly on this topic, how to be optimistic. So the readers can definitely find something for them. All right, I'm going to have a lot of optimism and that our listeners will find something. Uh, So how did researching this book uh, change your life? Are there things you do differently now after all this research? I hope so. I definitely hope I'm kinder. I'm trying to be kinder. I'm trying to see a lot of things uh, as health behaviors that I haven't recognized as such before. Uh, Before I wrote Growing Young, I was always very self, I mean, health conscious. So I ate very healthily. I exercise, I I run. Uh, And, uh, but you know, before, for example, uh, if I were to give up on my daily run to meet with friends, I would feel as if I were losing something in terms of health because I wasn't doing my run, right? Uh, Now I recognize that maybe 
sometimes skipping on my runs to meet with friends is actually perhaps even better for me because being with my friends is also a health behavior. Uh, one very uh, specific example, I was planning to run a half marathon this year. It was before coronavirus happened, um, but uh, obviously it required a lot of preparation. Uh, normally I run, you know, five, six K a day and to run a health marathon, you have to run much more and it takes a lot of time. And I realized that the time it would take, it would take the time away from me spend talking with my husband, basically sitting on the couch and having daily chats with him. And I decided that it's much better for me also from the perspective of my health, not just my mental health and happiness, but also my physical health to run maybe a little bit less and spend more time on my on the couch with my husband, maybe with a glass of wine, chatting and just connecting because this is also about my health, not just about uh, some kind of pleasure and happiness that has nothing to do with physiology. It actually also is about longevity. All right, so, so uh, maybe you're somebody who doesn't naturally initiate conversation or social interactions with others, or maybe you don't necessarily feel motivated to volunteer. I mean, do you, how do you do this? How do you pull this off? I mean, people often ask me, you know, if you are an introvert, are you doomed? And what I answer is that absolutely not. It's not about being the, you know, the heart of the party. You don't have to be surrounded by hundreds of people and going to nightclubs and, and things like that. It's just about connecting. And for example, introverts are very good at connecting one on one. You don't have to have 50 people in the room and all the time around you, but do connect. And you know, most people enjoy it, even very who, those who are very much introverted still usually have at least one very good friend. So uh, as long as you the number of your friends is not zero, uh, whatever feel go feels good for you, if your needs are satisfied, if you really feel that there are people who will help you if you are in need, if there that there is someone you can you can always talk to, whether it's one person or five or seven, it really doesn't matter as long as you feel the number is right for you. Uh, this is what's necessary. But we have to think about uh, friendships and relationships and community in terms of health as well. It's not just something you know on top of your um, miracle foods and fat diets and so on and so on. It's actually something that's possibly even more important than. Uh, uh, some things that we do, you know, the obsessive uh, dieting and things like that, it may be more important for you, for your longevity than that. Uh, so if somebody reads your book and they use this as a great pickup line in a bar after COVID saying, can I buy you a drink because I want to live a lot longer, you know? But... <laughs> Sure, I haven't thought of that, but we, why not? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, you could write a book just on that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, give me other than that as a pickup line, give me another <laughs> example of what our listeners can, can do, um, in their day to day life of improving this aspect. I mean, so definitely make sure to, to put away basically schedule time for your friendships. We are so busy these days and we so, but we spend so much time thinking about nutrition and exercise. We have apps, for example, you know, that remind us about our fasting or about drinking water. And, but we don't really have apps that remind you, you know, call your friend or meet with your friends. And we should, you know, we should have reminders also setting, did you call your best friend today? Uh, have you talked with your husband or your wife today? And these are at least as important for your health. So we should really think in this in these terms to make time in our calendars for our friends. And research really does show that it's important to meet your friends as often as possible. And once a month is not enough. And, um, and also things like, for example, uh, conscientiousness is another thing we haven't actually discussed. So studies show that being conscientious, so this kind of person who uh, who has a clean desk and keeps pays bills on time, it may sound very boring, but actually it's very good for your health. And not only because people like that take their pills on time and uh, go to their doctor's appointments as they should, there are actually physiological links as well that, uh, that researchers find. So 
and these things, just as optimism, like we talked before, so conscientiousness, optimism, uh, this kind of personality characteristics can be worked on. They can be changed. Can can be practiced. Just like just like exercise, right? The same for empathy. It can. It's like a muscle. The more you use it, the more you try to be optimistic, try to be conscientious and empathetic. The more you become so. So basically, fake it till you make it. You know, and uh, and think it of as a muscle and something that can be very slowly improved. Hmm. So is there any research, you know, we've talked about COVID, is there any research that um, Zoom calls and Skype and FaceTime can help this social interaction or do we have to have, you know, physical presence? I mean, definitely physical presence is the most important and the best because we need, for example, touch, physical touch. So hugging, you know, holding hands, touching or looking in directly into each other's eyes. These call these are the best for getting this boost of the social hormones like oxytocin. But definitely if we are isolating and we we cannot be in person with the other people it's definitely better to call or video call than to text there are actual research there's actual research exactly on the topic showing that when you hear the voice of uh, another person you get a bigger boost of oxytocin so this laugh hormone that also is good for uh, for example keeping your uh, inflammation in check uh, then if you text so it's better to call than text because texting just doesn't bring the same oxytocin boost uh, as hearing actually hearing the voice of the other person that's great advice uh, i have uh, two grown daughters uh, it's actually one of my daughter's birthdays today and i gotta call her uh but she hates phone calls hates them loves text she always says text me don't call me i don't have the time to call so I'm, I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna tell her that today. <laughs> yeah, All right. she's getting less oxytocin. <laughs> yeah, you, you need more oxytocin. Well, Marta, it's, it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. Uh, where can listeners find Growing Young and learn more about you and your research? So there is the book's website, I think is the best place to go. It's www.growingyoungthebook.com. And you can find me on Twitter. That's the best place, I guess. It's, uh, my, it's uh, M. Zaraska, so Z-A-R-A-S-K-A, -A, and you can connect there with me. Very good. And what's, um, what's next for you now that you're going to live forever? <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see about that. I'm trying my best. Hopefully, I will live long enough to r write many more books. I'm I'm uh, working on my third right now. So I, I actually started writing yesterday. So um, that's uh, yeah. Very so good. I I already have one thousand words. So seventy four thousand to go, more or less. <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what you mean. All right. Well, take care of yourself, and I hope uh, COVID doesn't reactivate over there. But it sounds like it's coming. Unfortunately. All right. Bye. Thank you. All right. It's time for our audience question. This week, Klimba Roo on Instagram asks, is sugar withdrawal a real thing? During my first attempt to cut out sugar, I started to feel really nauseous around day three. Now on another attempt, I'm starting to see, feel sick around day six. That's actually a really good question, and um, I, I'm going to use it as a teaser for the upcoming book, The Energy Paradox. Quite frankly, about 80% of us are not necessarily addicted to sugar, but have what's called insulin resistance, or metabolic syndrome, or metabolic inflexibility, where you cannot right away make the change for your mitochondria, the little energy organelles in all your cells, which can burn glucose, which is half sugar, or free fatty acids, fat as fuels. And about 80% of us can't make a switch because we're basically stuck on burning glucose as a fuel. But don't worry, help is coming. Uh, I'm going to teach you how to get out of that trap that about 80% of Americans are in. So please stay tuned, but that's a great question. So you're right, uh, you're probably metabolically inflexible, and we're going to teach you how to get flexible. All right, 
Time for a review of the week. This week's review comes from Elite Dragon on YouTube, who watched the episode on the end of Alzheimer's disease and wrote, Thank you so much, Dr. Gundry and Dr. Bredesen, for this fantastic session and for all of your hard work. My whole family listened. This is the first time I've watched you on YouTube, and since then, your podcast has been running all day long. Boy, you have nothing better to do, Elite Dragon. But th th thanks so much for sharing. It's great to hear that you and your family are dedicated to learning and improving your health together. So each time you rate and review us on iTunes, it helps us reach a wider audience so that we can continue our mission of transforming everyone's health, and I do mean everyone, all across the globe. Because, as you know, I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.